Hold up. Welcome to Joe's Productions. Today we're taking a look at the presidency for all your government and AP government needs. So let's get started. The presidency. The president holds the most powerful position in the world and the American public looks to the president for everything from economic growth to protecting the nation and a whole slew of other things. In fact, the role and responsibilities of the executive branch increased dramatically in the last 20th century. In spite of this increase in power, the president still needs the support of Congress and the public to get things done. This is all part of the Madisonian system of checks and balances. Remember, the Americans tend not to like concentrations of power, and so they want the president to solve all these problems, but there are checks in place. It is tremendously hard to solve problems, especially in divided government, different parties controlling the executive and legislative branch, and you can see that has been the norm since 1968. Remember, the original Articles of Confederation had no executive branch, and when they created the Constitution, one of the arguments can be seen in Federalist Number 70. It argued in favor of a single executive. This was written by Alexander Hamilton and published in 1788. And one of the main points Hamilton made was that a unitary executive is necessary to ensure accountability in government. You have one person to take responsibility for the actions, not a group of people who could hide from blame. There are some basic requirements to become president. So if that's your goal, you better be age 35 or older a natural born citizen. You can't be naturalized. You have to have lived within the United States for the previous 14 years. So who has been president? Well, you can see him on that little picture right there, but they're all Protestant until Kennedy is elected in 1960. They're all white until Obama was elected in 2008. And they're all dudes as of 2018. On to becoming president, how they got there. Well, the most basic way to get there is you must win the electoral vote. So it doesn't matter if you get the most votes as long as you win the electoral votes. And there's been moments in American history where the person who got the most votes did not become president because someone else won the electoral vote. You get a four-year term if you are able to win the electoral vote, and there have been 13 presidents who have succeeded in getting two terms or more. And if you're thinking more, what? Well, shout out to FDR who did get elected four different times. No one could do this anymore because the 22nd Amendment was ratified in 1951, well after FDR had already passed away, and this limited the presidency to two terms. Previously, it was only the precedent that was set by George Washington. If the president should die or resign, the vice president is the next in line for the office, and there are quite a number of notable individuals who made their way to the presidency in this manner. For example, Theodore Roosevelt when McKinley was assassinated, Harry Truman when FDR died in office, and you can see others right there on the graphic. Speaking of the vice presidency, the 25th Amendment in 1967 created the process of selecting a new vice president and the procedure for dealing with presidential disabilities. If there is a vacancy in the vice presidency, the president can pick someone and they would be approved by a simple majority vote in both houses of Congress. The 25th Amendment also stipulates that the vice president becomes acting president if the president is temporarily disabled or unable to do the job due to health or other mental issues. Those are some of the ways to become president. What about no longer being the president? Impeachment is when charges are brought against a government official. There have been only two presidents that have been formally impeached. Impeachment does not necessarily mean removal from office. It is the bringing of charges. And Andrew Johnson in 1868 and Clinton, Bill Clinton in 1998 are the only two presidents to have been impeached. Nixon was going to be impeached, but he quit before that could happen. And the way it happens is the House of Representatives votes for impeachment. And once again, it does not mean the president is removed from office. The president can be impeached for treason, bribery, and other high crimes and misdemeanors. This is in the Constitution, and there continues to be ongoing debate about what an impeachable offense is. What is, what constitutes high crimes? It's unclear. Once the House votes to impeach, the Senate conducts a trial, and in order for the president to be removed from office, there needs to be a two-thirds vote in the Senate to remove the president. And although two presidents have been impeached, neither Andrew Johnson or Bill Clinton were removed from office. What about the presidential powers? Article 2 of the Constitution deals with the power of the executive branch. And Article 2 is very short. Unlike the details spelled out in Article 1 dealing with the legislative branch, 
It's kind of short on specifics. There are a few things, some enumerated powers of the president. These include vetoing legislation, nominating Supreme Court judges, granting pardons. In addition, the Madisonian system of checks and balances and shared powers places limits on presidential power. Some example of these checks and balances and the fact that power is shared can be seen in the following examples. The president can appoint cabinet members and judicial nominees, but these individuals are subject to approval by the Senate. Another example is the president is the commander in chief, but it is ultimately Congress who declares war. So in the Constitution, the powers of the president are not absolute and can oftentimes be checked by other branches of government. Another power presidents have is an executive order. It is a directive issued by the president that manages the running of the federal government and has the authority of law. It is an implied power from the president's executive powers granted in the Constitution, and more and more presidents are using the power of an executive order. And you can see Trump right there holding up one of his executive orders. As mentioned previously, power of the presidency has increased over time, and there are factors that have led to increased presidential power. These includes the actions of the president. So individual presidents have done things that have increased the power of their position. Some examples, Lincoln's suspension of the writ of habeas corpus during the Civil War, FDR's New Deal increased the role and responsibility of the federal government, and although the New Deal programs were passed by Congress, it was the leadership of Franklin Roosevelt that ushered in this tremendous change and expansion of the role of the federal government. The powers of the presidency were increased during Johnson administration as he escalated U.S. involvement in Vietnam following the Gulf of Tonkin and Nixon widening the war in Vietnam to include the bombing in Cambodia. All of these are actions that have taken place which have increased the power of the presidency. Another reason for increased presidential power is new technology technology, social media, presidents are able to directly communicate not just to the American people but the world, and more advanced weapons technology means presidents have more powerful tools under their disposal. Another factor is the rise of the U.S. as a superpower. We are the most powerful military and economy in the world. You can see if you compare our military spending to some of the others, and since the president is the commander-in-chief, this means more power. But this increase in power has caused controversy, and the Vietnam War and Watergate scandal eroded the public's trust in government and led to new calls for restrictions on presidential power. And this famous quote by Nixon kind of illustrates this fear of growing presidential power. What about running the government the chief executive? The executive branch is not just the president, it's also the vice president, the cabinet, the executive office, the White House staff, the first lady, and much, much more. The president runs the show of the executive branch, but there's a lot of components to it. Let's take a closer look at some of these. Previously, the vice presidency was largely a ceremonial position. In the Constitution, it basically says the vice president votes in the Senate if there's a tie, and their power really stops there. But more recently, oftentimes a vice president was selected to help balance the ticket and to attract potential voters. What this means is presidents will put people on their ticket who have strengths that they may not have. So if a candidate's weak in foreign policy, get someone who's known for their foreign policy expertise. Or if a candidate is from the South, get maybe a vice president from the North to help attract voters across the United States. So this is what is meant by balancing the ticket. Over the last 70 years, there has been an increasing role of the vice president in policy and advocacy. So the role is much larger than it used to be. Some examples under George George W. Bush, Vice President Cheney, was very influential in, in developing the administration's foreign policy in places like Iraq and Afghanistan. And under Obama, Vice President Biden had vast experience in government from his previous roles in Congress. So the position of vice president is much more glamorous. Another part of the executive branch is the cabinet. It is not mentioned in the Constitution, but it has existed as a group of advisors since George Washington. And basically the cabinet is the group of advisors who head federal agencies and executive departments. And you can see at the top right there, that is George Washington's OG cabinet. You had, of course, Hamilton as, as Secretary of the Treasury, Jefferson as 
Secretary of State. And whereas George Washington had four members of his cabinet, today you have roughly 15 different members of the cabinet that are the heads of 15 different federal agencies. But the Senate confirms presidential nominees for cabinet head. Another part of the executive branch is the executive office, which was created in 1939 by FDR to help oversee the growing government bureaucracy. The executive office has changed and evolved over time, but here are a few examples. The National Security Council gives advice on national security and foreign policy to the president. The Council of Economic Advisors gives advice on economic policy and the Office of Management and Budget prepares the president's annual budget. So there's a lot of influence within the executive office. Another part is the White House staff. Around 600 people make up the White House staff. Tremendous variety of jobs, everything from cooks to people who respond to letters to the president to a variety of different roles and some key players. Amongst them are the chief of staff. This is who the president meets with daily. They provide info to the president and they really act as a gatekeeper who gets access to the president, what information the president sees, and the chief of staff is a very important role. You also have the press secretary who controls the messaging of the president to the media, very close interactions with the president on a daily basis, making sure the president's message is getting out to the American people. Although there is no formal constitutional role for the first lady or hopefully one day first hubby, many have influenced their husbands and taken on various campaigns. Abigail Adams famously pressured her husband John Adams to remember the ladies. Edith Wilson ran stuff when Woodrow Wilson had a stroke. Eleanor Roosevelt advocated for various causes, everything from women's rights to African-American civil rights and so on. Hillary Clinton played a key role during Bill Clinton's administration trying to push for health care reform. Michelle Obama pushed a healthy eating and exercise campaign. And current First Lady Melania Trump has a be best campaign? What about the president and their relationship with Congress? In the Constitution, it says the president is required to address Congress annually in the State of the Union address and behind him or her you will see the Vice President and the Speaker of the House. The State of the Union address runs on TV so the President is not only speaking to Congress but also the American people. And oftentimes at the State of the Union address the President lays out his or her legislative agenda and sometimes the presidency is known as the chief legislator. Although they can't actually pass legislation, they do have some tools when dealing with Congress. And one of the most obvious tools in legislation is the veto. The veto is the presidential power of rejecting a law passed by Congress. So when the president gets a bill from Congress, they have some options. They can sign it into law, they can do nothing, in which case it becomes law after 10 days. But the veto is a formal power that enables the president to check Congress. Even the threat of a veto can influence the legislative process. Oftentimes a president will just threaten a veto to get a law changed or to influence the legislative process. But a two-thirds vote in Congress can override a presidential veto, but that is difficult to achieve. A pocket veto is when a president does not sign a law for 10 days and Congress adjourns. The bill is dead, so don't even have to veto it if Congress adjourns and there's no signature, it's gone. Occasionally, you'll hear a discussion of line item veto. This is when you reject certain parts of a bill without vetoing the entire bill. As appealing as this may sound, the president can't do this. They do not have the power to do this. Certain governors do have that power, but not the executive branch at the federal level. Another role of the president in Congress is the president also serves as the party leader. As the president is trying to get their legislative agenda implemented, they need to build support amongst people from their party in Congress. Congress. But if you recall, party loyalty in Congress is not absolute. Remember from the previous video, parties are decentralized and members of Congress need to please their constituents first, especially during election time or if the president is not very popular. So if you're not popular, you're probably not going to be able to convince members even of your own party to go along with your agenda. Presidents can support party members during campaigns and many candidates will try to ride the presidential coattails. This is when voters support a candidate of the same party as the president because the president's popular, so I'm gonna vote for people who belong to the same party of the president, but this presidential coattail phenomenon is limited because during midterm elections, often a party that occupies the White House tends to lose seats during midterm election. You can see it's very rare for the party in power to gain seats and the amount of influence a president has over the legislative process is also determined by popularity 
and level of public support for the president. So yes, it's not it's not only whether or not the president's party controls Congress, but the amount of public support matters. Higher approval ratings mean members of Congress are more likely to roll with the president and their agenda. An electoral mandate is when a candidate wins by a large margin, which often means they have the support to implement their policy agenda. So in 1932, FDR easily defeated Hoover, and as a result, he was able to get a lot of things done especially during those first 100 days. If you've got high approval ratings, you're going to be able to get more things done. There are limits of public support. Even if a president is enormously popular, they are unlikely to sway members of Congress with ideological differences. So a liberal candidate's probably not going to get conservatives buying into their legislative proposals and vice versa. Another important thing for presidents to have is legislative bargaining skills. This plays a key role in the success or failure of a presidential agenda, especially amongst members of their own party. Lyndon Johnson was very famous with his unique approach to rallying support for his ideas and bargaining and persuasion are informal powers that enable the president to secure congressional action. So meeting with different members of Congress, Congress, both within your party and the opposition party to try to build support. As you will hear about the first 100 days of an administration, this is the honeymoon period. Their popularity tends to be very high. It's the opportunity for the president's administration to set the tone, to set their priorities, and to try to get things done in the beginning stages of their four-year term. But it's important to keep in mind, even the most skilled presidents have difficulty, especially if the opposition party controls Congress. It's hard to get things done in an era of divided government. One of the most important jobs of the president is their role in national security. The president serves various roles in the realm of foreign policy and national security. Amongst them are, they are the chief diplomat. They have the power of diplomatic recognition. They can receive foreign governments, receive ambassadors, appoint ambassadors, and relations with countries who governments they consider illegitimate. As chief diplomat, they have the power of treaty negotiation. Any treaty they negotiate must be approved by a two-thirds Senate vote, but if they are unable to get a two-thirds Senate vote, they can rely on an informal power, which is an executive agreement. This is kind of like a treaty without the need of congressional ratification. And as chief diplomat, they also engage in personal diplomacy, meeting with other foreign leaders, trying to build relationships and everything from economics to the war on terror. Another role of the president is that of commander-in-chief, and in their capacity as commander-in-chief, the president has the power to deploy the armed forces. Although they have the power to send out the troops, Congress declares war and appropriates money, but war power has shifted to the executive branch in modern history. In fact, the last declared war was declared in 1941, and that is World War II. And even though we haven't declared war since 1941, presidents have sent troops without a formal declaration of war to all sorts of different conflicts around the world. To address this growing presidential power, Congress passed the War Powers Resolution, which requires the president to seek congressional approval prior to deploying troops. Now, the president wouldn't need prior approval in the event of a national emergency, but would need to report to Congress within 48 hours and end the activity within 60 days unless a formal declaration of war by Congress was obtained. And the War Powers Resolution was a response to the escalation of the Vietnam War without congressional approval and the growing concern about presidential power. In spite of the goals of the War Powers Resolution, presidents continue to find ways around these restrictions and American troops continue to fight without a formal declaration of war. And if you paid attention in 11th grade U.S. history, you know presidential power expands during a time of national crisis. Currently with the war on terror, we have the issue of executive power with NSA wiretapping, the use of drones, and a whole host of issues as a result of new technology and new enemies. And finally, the president plays the role of crisis manager, not necessarily just national security, but any sudden and potentially dangerous event. It could be a natural disaster like, like Hurricane Katrina, a, an attack like what happened on 9-11, to the discovery of missiles in Cuba under the Kennedy administration. Very often, these crises can become a defining moment for their administration. If they handle them poorly, they will suffer the consequences in their approval rate. 
rating. Speaking of approval, power from the people, the public presidency, presidential approval ratings tend to fluctuate. Typically, economic prosperity is great for the approval rating of the president. Although many factors go into the health of the economy, the president will oftentimes get the credit or the blame depending upon the health of the economy. With these numbers in mind, the president will often attempt to win over public support for their agenda by going public. This can be by speaking directly to the citizens on national TV, going on late night talk shows, going on social media to hopefully shape public opinion to favor their policies. The Office of the Presidency offers its holder a bully pulpit, a concept made popular by Theodore Roosevelt. And what this means is the president is in a position in which to mobilize. They can communicate directly with the American people to set the agenda and changes in technology, the rise of social media, allow the president's message to be shared even faster than the days of Teddy. Sometimes presidents will issue signing statements. This is a statement signed by the president that informs Congress and the public of their interpretation of a law passed by Congress. In spite of all these different tools trying to shape public opinion, presidents have limited success of swaying public opinion. For many Americans, there's a lack of interest in politics. Oftentimes the public is uninformed on these complex policy issues, and many voters typically have ideologically set beliefs. They're set in their ways. It doesn't matter what the president says if they're from a different political party. Make sure you know about the president and the press. The press plays a critical role in the information the public gets about the presidency. Most administrations hold daily press briefings conducted by the press secretary in the room you see right there, and the press secretary will answer questions, lay out the administration's official positions. There are challenges and changes. The 24 hour media coverage means facts are not always verified. You have a rapid pace of information and the desire to be the first to report on a story sometimes leads to incorrect information being presented, especially on social media. And we have seen the rise of ideologically biased programming. And this is programming that favors one political ideology over another. And sometimes the truth gets thrown out the window in the process. Straight from the College Board framework, make sure you know different perspectives on the presidential role, ranging from a limited to a more expansive interpretation and use of power, continue to be debated in the context of contemporary events. In other words, what should be the power and responsibilities of the president continues to be debated and continues to evolve. There is a historical fear of government power. This can be traced back to the colonial days, and that is why we have constitutional safeguards like checks and balances embedded in the system. But like everything in government, it gets messy because there is a desire for a strong president during a crisis. So oftentimes we want our presidents to have a lot of power or when the president shares an individual's own policy beliefs. And one of the most important reasons why the American presidency is important, the president's longest lasting influence is in their judicial appointments to the Supreme Court. And as we will learn later, those judicial appointments are for life, and the president can appoint someone which will shape the direction of the court well after they leave office. Make sure you check out the website to get the notes, and if you haven't done so, click like, subscribe, tell a friend. Have a beautiful day. Peace.